We are at chapter 12, and our reading today will be verses 10 through 20. And so if you'll open your Bible to there and keep it open. For the public reading of Scripture, I'm going to read these verses. Genesis chapter 12, 10 through 20. This is the word of the Lord. Now there was a famine in the land. So Abram went down to Egypt to sojourn there, for the famine was severe in the land. When he was about to enter Egypt, he said to Sarai, his wife, I know that you are a woman beautiful in appearance, and when the Egyptians see you, they will say, This is his wife. Then they will kill me, but they will let you live. Say you are my sister, that it may go well with me because of you, and that my life may be spared for your sake. When Abram entered Egypt, the Egyptians saw that the woman was very beautiful. And when the princes of Pharaoh saw her, they praised her to Pharaoh, and the woman was taken into Pharaoh's house. And for her sake, he dealt well with Abram. And he had sheep, oxen, male donkeys, male servants, female servants, female donkeys, and camels. But the Lord afflicted Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarai, Abram's wife. So Pharaoh called Abram and said, What is this you have done to me? Why did you not tell me that she was your wife? Why did you say, She is my sister? So that I took her for my wife. Now then, here is your wife. Take her and go. And Pharaoh gave men orders concerning him, and they sent him away and his wife and all that he had. Oh, Lord, as we bow before this text, we know that we need your help to understand that world in light of this world. And so we receive this text as your word, fully authoritative, breathed out of your very mouth, and profitable for teaching, reproof and correction, and for training in righteousness. Equip us now. Make us in the image of your Son, through the ministry of your Word and Spirit, that we might bring glory to your name, in which we pray. Amen. Well, we do have quite a challenge in front of us, because we do, want to, we do tend to read this story, of all the stories about Abram, slash Abraham. His name hasn't been changed yet in the course of the narrative, and so uh, we struggle with this. He is Abram at this point. Um, We want to read this text with our modern eyes. So I want to actually do a little walk with you, uh, the kinds of questions we ask as we read this text with our modern eyes. And then I want to look at those same questions, walk back through the text again, hopefully with ancient eyes. And then to wrap it up, a theological eye. But at every turn, what I'm really hopeful that you'll leave with today is some encouragement, the same hope that the Israelites would have received when they heard this story from Moses. God is faithful even when we are faithless. God is a promise keeper. And we are promise breakers. God is faithful always. And because God is faithful to keep all His promises... We must trust Him even when the path seems fraught with danger. When it just seems like it's not going to go our way. That is when it's most important to trust God that He will be faithful to us. We have seen this nowhere more clearly than in the ministry of Jesus Christ. The faithful one from God who comes and fulfills all of God's promises of salvation to us as His people. So we want to keep him in the forefront of our thoughts that he has proven, God has proven himself trustworthy over and over again. I was listening to Kevin DeYoung teach on this text and he opened his sermon with an illustration about how humans struggle to keep their promises. I won't be able to rehearse it all like he did, uh, but I found this to be fascinating uh, being from the state of Alabama. He, um, 
and, and a fan of the Crimson Tide, which I know is to the chagrin of most of you. But he recounted how in the third Super Bowl, Joe Namath, who at that time was playing for the New York Jets, some of you probably remember this, even though they were the underdogs going into the game, that he promised a victory. And uh, the former quarterback of Bear Bryant delivered on his promise. But then, Kevin, that's, that's saying a lot from a Michigan boy to rehearse that story, right? He may not know where Joe Namath played college football because he didn't mention it. Uh, he left that for me to do. But, um, but it's quite a story because then he regaled, he re retold how so many in sports have tried to do similarly, guaranteeing a victory, but have been unable to deliver on their promise for victory. I don't know, there were 10 or 12 different examples from the sports world that he gave. Uh, even one young lady playing college basketball who said she was going to refund her scholarship if they didn't win the national championship. And, of course, her school didn't win the national championship. And Kevin says, I'm sure that she was thankful that the president of her college didn't make her keep good on her promise. It was a great reminder. I was um, bowled over by the, this, the number of people who, with audacity, uh, tried to guarantee uh, something that is really outside of their control. But this is the way of being human. Um, I can look back on my life, and there have been a, a, enough that it's uh, there's great learning moments about keeping my mouth shut, uh, boastfully saying I would do something, and then later on not have the ability to keep good on a promise made and have to go to the person and apologize for not being able to keep my word. It's just a part of the human experience. But we must remember this. Though we are unable to keep all our promises, though we can be faithless in light of the promises of God, God is not faithless. He is faithful and He is able always to keep all His promises. Amen. And we have, a, we have a story here that confronts us with the sin of one of the heroes of the faith, uh, with Abram. Uh, in, his, in his days uh, before uh, the covenant is solidified in chapter 15 and again in 17, he's still known as Abram. But yet in chapter 12, at the beginning of this chapter, he received the covenant promises from God, the land, name, nation promises. God was going to give him a land to dwell in. He was going to give him a great name, and he was going to give him many descendants. And he was going to tie himself. God was tying himself to Abram. And in chapter 17, when Abram has that that wonderful vision of God coming down and cutting covenant with him, solidifying his promises in a covenant relationship, solidified by, by sacrifice. God comes in the form of a smoking fire pot and he walks between the pieces and basically declares, Abraham, if I don't keep my promises to you, let what has happened to these animals happen to me. God bound himself to Abraham by covenant. And so really nothing that Abraham or Sarah can do, Abram or Sarai can do, will cause the covenant to fail, the promises of God to fail. But it sure seems like the covenant is in jeopardy. There's a famine in the land. And with uh, modern eyes, we begin to read, okay, something bad has happened uh, that's forcing uh, Abram out of the land God had promised him. He was already dwelling in Canaan. He was there. He was in that place. And famine comes. And we know from our reading of Scripture that this happens quite often. This is a common experience. Uh, there will be you know, poor harvest, poor rainfall. And so there will be famine. There will be a lack of food. And uh, folk will have to go looking for food in other countries. And so Abram picks up and he goes to sojourn. To sojourn in Egypt. Now, that doesn't mean he's going for a two-week vacation. That means he's picked up his belongings and he is moving to Egypt to stay until he can't stay there any longer. So it could be a, a significant period of time. He's basically going there to live as a resident alien, as an exile in that land. And uh, he's hoping to be received and accepted uh, by the Egyptians. Uh, but on his way, verse 11, he's about to enter Egypt and it dawns on him that this might not go well with him. Uh, 
In six more days, it will be my wife's birthday, which always occurs around uh, Valentine's Day. And so my wife made a pact with me many years ago that if I would remember her birthday, we wouldn't have to celebrate Valentine. We could just, we could just do our romance one time. Um, but we are getting close to that day, guys. So you may not be like me. You may not get off on the Valentine thing. You might have to um, fulfill your romantic obligations as husbands. You could possibly take a note out of Abram's playbook here. I'm not necessarily recommending that, but it is interesting that he believes his wife is dangerously beautiful. I know that you are a woman, beautiful in appearance. Remember, she's 65 years old at this time. So that part you should take out of his playbook. Right? Remembering your wife is always the apple of your eye. But he recognizes that in the way things work in that world, uh, that might put him in danger. And so he hatches a plan with her that as modern people, especially our modern women, and I don't mean by attitude, I just mean by the time in which we live. The air we breathe, the water we drink in our culture, uh, this plan does not seem good to us. Right? Now, uh, whether it actually is or not, Moses does not provide commentary, does not tell us, this is, this is good, this is bad. Abraham should have done this. No, Abraham should not have done that. We don't, we don't get that commentary. It just is what it is. And so that's why I think it's important to take time to read it uh, and make note of how we tend to do it as modern. So first, why is Abram so concerned with his own welfare? Right? This is what modern people want to know. I, I'm not saying this is necessarily a legitimate question, right? Because like, first of all, we all are concerned with our lives, well, like living, if we have the option not to die but to live. I mean, it's why people get colonoscopies and other dangerous procedures done to their bodies. Like, so that I might live a long time, right? Uh, I want to keep going. But we are, we like, He's like concerned to the point that he's willing to put his wife in jeopardy. And this is where the problem really begins. Um, why, did, why was he willing to lie about Sarai? I know you're a woman in be- who's beautiful in appearance. And when the Egyptians see you, they're going to say, this is his wife. And they're going to kill me. And they're going to let you live. So say you are my sister. I thought he was a patriarch. This is the modern eye. This is the modern eye, the modern way of thinking about the text. Say you are my sister. Why did he lie about her? That it may go well with me because of you. That you might win us favor while we're here in this land. See, there's two problems with this. God had promised that there was going to be descendants that were going to come through Sarah. And she was barren at the time. But now she's about to become the wife of another man. She was about to enter the harem of Pharaoh. And that's a problem. And you might be asking, why would he do that? Why, out of such a concern for his own welfare, would he lie about his wife? And more importantly, you might be asking, well, why did God still bless? And what did poor Sarah think about all of this? You know, there's no, there's no comment about Sarah. She's... Um, Part of the story, but we're not told what she thinks about her husband's plan. And I think living in the 21st century, we're deeply concerned about that. We would like to hear from her. We would like to know that she thought her husband had fallen on his head. I mean, right? Aren't these the questions that you ask when you hear this story? I, I don't think the Bible is afraid to tell us the truth about the sin of Abraham. It has not been afraid to tell us about the sin of Adam. It's not been afraid to tell us about the sin of Noah. Likewise, I don't think it's really afraid to tell us about any sordid details. But we're going to save that thought for when we get to looking at this with an ancient eye. More grievous, we ask, does the text, does the scripture text advocate the subjugation of women? When we read this story and we read about how Sarah gets treated almost like property, She's, she's Abram's uh, a wife, and he willingly gives her to another man who basically just takes her into his harem. Is the Bible advocating these things? I think this is one of the reasons why in the wisdom of God, 
by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, there really is no comment made. I don't think there is an advocating for the subjugation of women. But it's a question we ask. Is it an application people could, could make? Yes, if we were limited to reading it with a modern eye. If these were the only questions that we were asking. And the reason we're asking these questions is because we want to moralize the Old Testament. We want to look back at these, uh, these verses 10 through 20 and we want to know what, what's the moral? What's the life lesson that we learn from these things? And the Bible doesn't really work that way. So as we transition to our next point about looking at it with, with ancient eyes, uh, I just want to be able to say that this verse really isn't about, this text really isn't about Abraham or Sarah. Not at the end of the day. This text is really about God and what He's doing with His people. Because as I begin, God is faithful even when we are faithless. There's no hope without that reality. And, and because God's faithful to keep all his promises, and remember the promises he had made. I mean, it really seems like they're in jeopardy. It begins with the famine. This occasion has come upon them. And then Abraham goes, goes down to Egypt, and he allows his wife to be taken into the harem of, of the Pharaoh. The covenant promises seem, humanly speaking, now to be put into jeopardy. What will happen to them? But in the ancient world, they would look at these matters a little differently. In the rest of the, of, the, of, the, of the globe, on the rest of this planet, there are many other nations that probably live with a greater connection to the ancient world on the first point I want to say. But in many Western nations where we live with a submission to a rule of law, we, which is a great blessing, we do live in a less cruel world. I remember one of my very first trips to a third world nation. I know that's not politically correct verbiage anymore, but uh, to, to the developing world, it was in a, in a place that uh, you know, didn't have the same kind of rule of law that we have in the United States. Um, I witnessed an a, a automobile accident. And in these places... Um, the, the automobile accident, when it occurs, the person's fault of the accident and who's responsible to pay is determined by who is stronger, bigger, meaner, and can tear up more stuff when they get out of their car to argue about what happened. Sometimes it's known as the law of the jungle. The ancient world is a cruel world. And Abram is correct to be concerned not only about his life, but also about Sarai's life. More, more, with more complexity, more complicated, if you will, is the fact that Sarah, Sarai, is Abram's half-sister. So when he says, hey, tell them you're my sister, maybe Abram, I'm still looking at it from a modern viewpoint, Maybe Abram has justified this half-truth about his half-sister. But it is a different world. And if we don't move to that world and work to get out of our own skin and our own operations, we'll never really understand what's going on. Also, terms like sister or brother, this is an aside. I'm not trying to make a big point out of this, okay? So... If you want to meet me at the back door afterwards and you want to talk about how the text is very clear that when he said sister, they all understood sister, not some other relationship. I get it, okay? So this is an aside. But in that culture, in the ancient world, these terms would have been used more broadly, like the way the English heritage world would use the word cousin, or maybe even in Alabama, it has a broader context. <clears throat> Sarah would have been wise to all of these dangers. She was a woman of her times. Uh, I liken this. Now, don't hate me. For, don't, don't be upset with me for this, okay? Um, I'm very happy with my home, and I'm very happy with the world in which I live. But I will tell you this. Um, there have been changes. Since I've been alive, there have been changes uh, in the way uh, wifely work 
is viewed and performed. Um, when, my, when my grandpa would get up in the morning to go work, my grandmother got up with him, whether he got up at four or whether he got up at six. It didn't matter. When, when he got up, she got up. She made his breakfast every day. She made his lunch every day. Sent him out with a thermos full of sweet tea. You thought I was going to say coffee, but that's, it was actually a mason jar with a lid on it. Tucked down in this cooler. And um, this was hilarious. She ironed. And I don't expect this from women. I'm not advocating. I'm just telling you how things were. She ironed everything in the house. She ironed the bed sheets. She ironed. You ever slept on iron bed sheets? Hey, I'm not advocating. I'm just telling you how things were. Um, she, she, ironed every, she ironed all of his shirts. And there was this one day at church, this man, uh, my grandpa loved to tell this story, that this man approached him and says, John, you are always dressed so well. Your shirts are just immaculate. Where do you get your laundry done? <laughs> and he just smiled. Um, I get my shirts done over here at Sunshine Cleaners. <laughs> just want that stated for the record. Sarah Sarai, this time, is a woman of her times. She, she would have lived as a woman of her times. And so these relationships, they would not have, and, and, and the things that we read in this text, they wouldn't have, wouldn't have bothered her the way they bother a modern reader reading them. She's a strong woman. Can you imagine the strength of character she must have had to endure the things that she endured? And yet, the scripture is even clear about her own foibles and weaknesses and sins in later stories that we'll get to in the weeks to come. But as we look back on this text, as we try to understand that world in relation to this world, will you take a minute and absorb this text with an ancient eye. Because at the end, it's not really about Abraham and Sarah. It's not really about being able to moralize their actions into a life lesson for us. Rather, this story is the truth about human weakness and human frailty. Nurtured, nourished, and strengthened by the faithfulness of God to carry them through a famine to carry them through the dangers of sojourning in a foreign land. She would have had a sincere concern for her husband. And we must avoid chronological snobbery to look back and wonder about these people. But rather to receive the text as it's given to us so that we can then see it with a theological eye. First of all, there is a recapitulation, a repeating, a, a sort of a, a narrative structure that helps us see prior things. And then we're going to look at how there is also a recapitulation, that is a, a repeating of things about events to come. This in no way uh, is to um, say anything negative about the historical truthfulness of these texts. This is what happened. But Moses does tell the story in a way to bring out those points that would most readily connect with his audience. And remember, God is the ultimate author working through human agency, but Moses is the human author, and he is telling these stories as an origin story for the children of Israel, who themselves have just left Egypt and are on their way to the promised land, in fact, retracing Abraham's steps. So first, if you look at it through the lens of the story of Adam, we have concerns about a wife. We have words of deception that end in an ultimate uh, and um, an inevitable expulsion from the land. In Eden, we have Adam and Eve uh, encountering uh, the serpent and uh, a tree forbidden to eat. And when they fall, they're blaming everyone but themselves. And they are removed from the presence of God under curse. What is fascinating here, what is most helpful and most hopeful here, is that with Abraham, though he is 
also looking to his wife. There is Pharaoh there. Uh, a lie is told. And then ultimately um, ending in an expulsion, not from Eden, but from Egypt. But this time, not under cursing, but with blessing. He has plundered the Egyptians. You see it there in verse 16, if it's any wonder, right? For her sake, uh, Pharaoh dwelt well with Abram. He gave him sheep, he gave him oxen. This is like probably the, the marriage dowry. He, he paid for his sister, paid for that uh, marital bond. And then at the end, when he is expelled, when he is sent on his way, um, Pharaoh gave men orders concerning him. It's verse 20. And they sent him away with his wife and all that he had. Pharaoh, in a sense, I think Abram would deny this. God did this. But Pharaoh made Abram a rich man. He leaves Egypt with much wealth. Again, with our modern eye, but even looking back at the ancient world, as we want to think about this theologically, we wonder, uh, well, since Pharaoh took Sarah into his harem, did he have sexual relationship with her? You know, and the text is silent on that issue. And so because of that silence, there are some who think, yes, he did. He must have. And that's why the Bible doesn't want to talk about it. But I would remind you that the Bible doesn't shy away from talking about sexual sin. Whether that's Lot and his daughters, um, Sodom and Gomorrah, um, Noah and his drunkenness, or even Cain and Abel and their murder. The Bible does not shrink away from telling us the truth about the sinfulness of human beings. And I personally believe that if, if the covenant promises had been put in that kind of jeopardy, the Bible would have told us plainly because it doesn't shy away from speaking the truth. And so I take the silence not as um, admission that it did happen, but rather as evidence that it did not happen. And then remember this. If it didn't happen, that's because of God's protecting hand. Because the story at the end of the day is really not about Abraham. It's really not about Sarah. The story is about God being faithful. Even though it seems like at every turn, Abram, Abram and Sarai... And even later, Abraham and Sarah, right? Um, that they're just always getting in God's way. Here, you'd have thought, well, they had learned their lesson. They had made it through Egypt unscathed, and God had kept them safe uh, and his promises intact. Uh, you think, well, does, does this mean that everything went well with them? No, they, they, they take the seeds of further sin with them. Um, Abram is, um, it says here he has female, male servants and female servants. And when we get to Genesis 16 and we read about uh, Sarah's female maidservant, Hagar, you know, where did she come from? The text tells us she was an Egyptian maidservant, likely a gift from Pharaoh himself. And there they are still trying to get in God's way, still trying to figure out how to keep the covenant promises of God uh, true rather than trusting and relying on God. And remembering at the end of the day, these stories are really not about Abraham or Sarah. They're about a faithful God. God is faithful. God's faithful to keep his promises in Christ. He is faithful to keep his promises to you, to save you ultimately, finally, eternally, to lead you, to bring you through this life and into the life to come. And when you're so discouraged, when you look around and wonder, why don't I have any friends? When you look around you and wonder, why am I struggling with this sickness? Why is why, is, why does my life seem to be fraught with depression, with anxiety, with hurtfulness? When I look at my marriage and wonder, why can't, I, why can't it seem to get any better? Remember this, Jesus Christ has promised to you to bring you faithfully to the end. And we keep pressing in, trusting Him, even when the path seems fraught with danger. One last thing. Uh, when this text opens, uh, Moses is telling the story about there being a famine in the land. A sojourn down to Egypt. And I can guarantee you every Israelite that heard his teaching that day would have, would have remembered, would have recalled 
why Jacob and all his kin ended up in Egypt to start with because there had been a famine in the land and Jacob sent some of his sons right down to find grain in Egypt and then they ended up sojourning there and because God had sent Joseph beforehand there was food in Egypt and they were provided for and then 400 years of slavery. Sarah became something of a slave in Pharaoh's harem. The Israelites later would find themselves again as slaves in Egypt And they would have seen those parallels in the telling of this story. And if our forefather Abram sojourned in Egypt and made his way out to the promised land, then we, retracing his footsteps, we will find God to be faithful as well to lead us through our own sojourn in Egypt and to that land that he had promised to Abraham so many years ago. And so now, as we stand here on this side of the cross, brothers and sisters, Preparing to come to this table to eat of this bread and to drink of this cup. What are we remembering today? The faithfulness of God to keep all his promises. Even going back to as early as Genesis chapter 3 verse 15. Which promised that there would be a seed of the woman who would come. An heir, a Messiah, an anointed one who would come. A Christ. And who would crush the head of the serpent. And on the cross and through the power of the resurrection... The Lord Jesus did that very thing and redeemed a people to God. And we, as we have read in so many places in our worship today, we are that people. Let's not be faithless anymore, but let's press in by the grace of God to trust the Lord that even when the path is fraught with danger and difficulty, let's press in and trust the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob If he kept his promises to them in Christ, then in Christ he will keep his promises to us as well. Heavenly Father, this morning as we bow our heads at the close of this sermon, and in the preparation to come to your table, we, O Lord, want to set down something of a stone of remembrance. We want to take what we have heard and we want it to inform our movement from the preached word to the seen word. May this bread and this wine, may this body and blood of Christ be to us a solidification of your promises like an altar laid down, a remembrance For indeed, that's what you tell us to do, is to remember. To remember the death and to remember the resurrection of Christ given on our behalf. For in remembering it, there is hope. Lord, we need hope. We need hope for our marriages. We need hope for our children. We need hope for for our parents. We need hope for our neighbors. We need hope for our own lives in all of these relationships. We need hope to be able to navigate the challenges that are before us. And so we pray, O oh God, that you come now by your spirit as we sing, as we pray, as we eat, and as we drink together. And that you would solidify your promises, that you would nourish your people, and you would strengthen us for the walk that is ahead of us. In Jesus' name, amen.